Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I wanted to give a shout out to everyone that has interacted with or followed Potterless on any form of social media. We're about to hit a thousand Twitter followers, which is insane, but I wanted to thank everybody who's liked the Facebook page or commented on Instagram posts or messaged me on Twitter, whatever it is. Thank you guys so much. It makes me feel so much closer and more in tune with you guys, the Potterless team, the Potterless community. And there's a lot of fun things that people will send. People will give me suggestions of how to make the show better. People will mention their favorite parts of the show. People will send me curated memes that don't have spoilers in them. It's a really good time and I have a lot of fun getting to know you guys better. So thank you for that. On a related note, it is the beginning of February. It's our first episode in February. And that means it's donation time. So at the beginning of February, we had 85 patrons on our patreon.com slash Potterless team. Team, meaning that we are giving $85 to a charity. And this month's charity was inspired by a message that I got by Zach H. Official on Twitter. On Twitter, I will often make fun of the new Fantastic Beast movie because Johnny Depp is in it. And he's been accused of domestic abuse and all the signs point to him doing it. And it really, I, it just bugs me that J.K. Rowling has not removed him from the film. So Zachary suggested that we pick a charity that helps with domestic abuse. So the one that we're giving to this month is Equality Now. And a Quality Now is a charity that works with grassroots organizations and activists seeking to protect and promote the human rights of women and girls all over the world by documenting violence and discrimination against women, mobilizing efforts to stop these abuses. So that's who we're giving to this month, and I think it's a really good idea by Zachary, and I think that it's something that can really help. So thanks to all the patrons who made this donation more by being a member of the team. Speaking of Patreon, we've new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Cami Johanning, Ashley Miller, and Tabaranfo, and huge shout out to Tori Larsic and Samantha Rose, our newest producer level patrons. They join the ranks of Leanne, Andreas, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Michael, Sadie, Emily, Jesse, Maggie, Natalie, Deborah, Daisy, Clow, Michael, Sean, Alexander, Rebecca, Frank, and Marchismo, who always win a claw machine game on their first try. If you want to be like these awesome people and pledge to the podcast in exchange for bonus content, head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 35 of Potterless, starring Julia Shafini of Spirits Podcast covering chapters 34 and 35 of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Potterless, the tale of a 25-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert, and I'm here joined with none other than the co-host of Spirits Podcast. You know her from previous episodes, Julia Shafini. Julia, how's it going? It's going good. I made myself a cocktail. I feel right at home already. Let's do this Okay, <laughs> That's good. It is uh, 5 o'clock on New Year's Day mm -hmm. for you, so that makes more sense than me, where it's like 2 o'clock. <laughs> hey, it's still New Year's Day. True, it is. So party it up. Why not? It's mm -hmm. 2018. Start it off right. But yeah, we are here to discuss the final five chapters of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. This episode will just cover two of them, chapters 34 and 35. But oh man, it's crazy how this book was a whole lot of nothing really happening, and then the final chapters come and everything happens. Joe turned up in those final chapters. So much. <laughs> so let's start the turning up right away. We started off with chapter 34, The Department of Mysteries. The first note that I made here was, oh shit, here because we go. it is not very often that the chapter title just straight up tells you exactly what's going down. It's usually some sort of hint about what's going on, but this one's just straight up. No bullshit, right to the chase. Hey, we're going in the Department of Mysteries. I mean, to be fair, the Department of Mysteries, in its essence, doesn't tell a lot of what's going on. So. Yes, it lives up to its name. It does. Very much so. Harry grabs the reins of his Thestral, and he begins slowly to get a feel for how to ride it. Luna is just absolutely killing it, like no problem at all. Luna's like a side saddle, like yep, kicking yep. all <laughs> kinds of ass. I was just like, yeah, she is. Fuck yeah. She's fantastic. Neville is struggling because he's Neville. Hermione, Ron, and Ginny are just very confused because they can't see anything, which uh. trying to put myself in their shoes, like how scary does it have to be to be flying through the sky on a giant beast that you cannot see? That sounds horrible. And just the way that Harry, as the narrator, describes it, 
it's horrifying by itself yes. when he can still see the thing. Imagine doing that just hurtling through the air on an invisible creature that you can't see. It's fucking terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying either way. Either you're flying invisible and you have no idea, frame of reference, like where to put your legs and stuff, mm-hmm. or you're on a Thestral, or as I like to call them, bony ponies, bony and ponies. you're scared to death. <laughs> checks out, checks out. So Luna helps out the other crew understand what to do. Harry just goes to the Thestral and figures maybe it works like an owl and just says, hi, I'd like to go to the Ministry of Magic's visitor entrance if you know where to go. And then it just shoots off like a rocket. So So pretty much every animal in the wizarding world is literate and can understand English and you just tell it where to go and it goes. That's how magical creatures work, apparently. I also, I don't like the implication that these creatures are like subservient to wizards where they're just, oh, these, these, Death winged horses are just here to transport children out of woods into central London, I guess. Yeah, I, I want to know more about the Thestrals because all we know about them is that they bring in the students and then they just kind of chill in the forest and they like blood. That's all we know about Thestrals right now, or at least that's all I know right now. Uh, I think Fantastic <laughs> Beasts and Where to Find Them, the, the book, not the movie, mm-hmm. uh, touches on it a little bit, but I can't remember exactly. Okay. I'm excited to to read those after. I got those for Christmas, and I'm so stoked about it. I, I saw. Got fanta- I, was I got very the whole little Hogwarts you. library. Very <laughs> excited for Fantastic Beasts. Very excited for Beetle the Bard, which I had been calling the Beetle and the Bard mm-hmm. my, the entirety of my life. I had no idea that it was called Beetle the Bard, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not excited at all for Quidditch throughout the ages. I know. So just I know. a great, it's okay. <laughs> just a great trilogy of books. <laughs> so uh, the team is securely behind him in the air as well. I'm there. In individual Thestrals. While they are flying, Harry thinks about how Sirius must not be dead or have done the bidding of Voldemort because he would have felt some sort of immense joy or satisfaction via the scar link with Voldemort. Mm -hmm. They finally arrive at the ministry and Ron is complaining and says never again, which this is the second time this book that he has done that over a mode of transportation, first being the night bus and now Thestrals. So Ron just doesn't like extreme modes of transportation. Not a good person to take to a theme park. I don't I don't want to spoil anything for you. Okay. <laughs> but this is not the last time that Ron goes never again about a mode of transportation. Yeah, I am I am not surprised at all. I need to go back and look and see if he said that when they use the port key or when they use flu powder. Or like, the car. The, the fucking car, man. Yeah, God. Ron just does not have good luck with transportation in general. Yeah, I'm never going on a road trip yeah. with Ron. I'll be like, all right, meet me there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just about see it you later. later, buddy. It's fine. <laughs> You'll get there eventually. <laughs> so they use the secret code in the telephone box, which is still so stupid. Uh, do you know what it spells out? Yeah, it's okay. magic with okay. T9 word. Cool, cool. And it's so... Uh, it's like making your password password. It's just... I don't know. Uh, it's. I, th- I feel like if you're the Ministry of Magic, you should have a more stringent way of getting in and this whole chapter is very problematic and we will certainly get into this Mm -hmm. so they use the secret code in the telephone box the phone dishes out visitor badges through the coin return slot they go down wait wait you're you're missing the best part oh what's the best part the badges that they get say rescue mission oh right yeah they ask like what is your purpose here and then they, he's like, Harry Potter. Rescue mission. Or did they say rescue? No, they said like, we're here to rescue a friend. I have the book. Hold on. Um, okay. We're here to save someone unless your ministry can do it first. <laughs> and then the badges pop out and they say rescue mission, which is weird. It's a bad sign that one of the like default answers at the Ministry of Magic of why are you here is rescue mission in the ministry. Like that's not a good omen for the Ministry of Magic. I mean, is that, it's oh, this magic. is very common. We should make this a. <laughs> it's that's magic. I'm could, sure yeah. that it wasn't one of the like a programmer entered some default yeah. options for people to put <laughs> it's, in. It's not like the doctor's form where it's like, why are you here? <laughs> one of the check boxes is we need to save rescue someone. <laughs> so they know. go down into the ministry. And the phone told them, like, you will have to check in at blah, 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 visitor desk. That doesn't happen because no one greets them when they go down. No one is there. They don't see anyone in the ministry at all. They just walk through the hallways of the Ministry of Magic and then go to an elevator, not being questioned by anyone. Then they push the floor for the Department of Mysteries. There's no badge requirement. It's not like a hotel where you have to like touch your room key or like a normal work office where you have to touch your room key to prove that you work in the building. It is so baffling to me that 
first off, to use the elevator, there's no ID check or anything, but also you can just go to the Department of Mysteries without any sort of confirmation of your identity? Uh, what? Yeah, I mean, okay. So here's my argument for this okay. because I'm going to argue for it. Oh uh, Yeah, yes. This is my interpretation. It, nothing in the book actually says that this is the reason it happens. Uh-huh. But the reason Harry is able to get into the Department of Mysteries and get into the ministry so easily is because that's what Voldemort wanted. Oh, so you think that you think that Voldemort set up all this stuff so that this exactly would happen? Yeah, because Lucius says later that the only people that can pick up the prophecy are Harry or Voldemort. Mm-hmm. So if they mm. set it up so it's so easy for him to go and get it, yeah. it makes more sense than just Harry is able to walk into a government building and go wherever he wants. Yeah, I did find it a bit suspicious that there was no one in the ministry. I guess they said it was like after hours. It's in the middle of the it night. It was already yeah. five o'clock when they left. It's 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 nighttime. I did find that a bit suspicious, but I do wish that they would have clarified it because unless I'm mistaken, I don't think that there was anything where Lucius was like, ha ha ha, I put on a spell to make sure no one would be in the hallway. You're like, ha ha ha, I jinxed the elevator. No, no, so there isn't. That was my thought, but when they never justified it, I was like, hmm, but maybe, I don't know, maybe people don't like working at the ministry and once <laughs> everyone's out, hits, they're like, later. No custodians <laughs> or anything, just fuck just it. Just run out. So Harry suggests that some of the crew should stay back. And Ginny makes a great observation that that won't do anyone any good because they're going into a department of mysteries and she just brings up the point, how are we going to know where you are or what to do? How would we even hear you? So Ginny just, oh my God, the fifth book should really be renamed to Harry Potter and the Rise of Ginny Weasley because she is just making a name for herself here. She just kills it. These like five chapters or like the couple before this too are just real good Ginny episodes. Mm -hmm. Just like real good chapters. Yeah. When I first read the books, I was, you know, one of the spoilers that I know is that Harry ends up marrying Ginny. And I always found it weird because I was like, Ginny just doesn't seem to really do anything as I was reading the first four. And now, now the fifth book comes along and Ginny is clearly one of the smartest people. She's like honestly second to Hermione in terms of intelligence and knowing what to do. Yeah, she's just a hardcore 14-year-old. Old. Yeah. I love her. Love it. Really do love it. So the whole team proceeds forward. The door to the Department of Mysteries just opens again. Think this is a bad insight. Like, come on, Ministry of Magic, get it together. They enter the large circular room that Harry keeps seeing in his dreams with all of the doors. I call this the video game room because Ooh. this is such a video game trope where they enter a room and then you're like, I don't know which door to go through. Yes. Oh my God. It so is. So while Harry is deciding what door to go through, there's a dozen to choose from there's a loud noise and all the candles in the room start to shake and what happens is the circular the circular wall starts to rotate and spin like a roulette machine of doors it finally stops ron asks what that was all about and jenny's thought is so that they can't tell which door they came in because oh shit. it's the department of mysteries and jenny's a damn genius like I, she is. in my note i wrote jenny is a genius wife her up right now harry <laughs> like <laughs> Lock it down. Maybe not because you're 14 and 15. Okay, but. true, true, true. But lock it down. <laughs> Harry just tries a random door, and when he opens it, it is not familiar. It has a big glass tank with green liquid in it. There are pearly white things swimming in it, which we learn later are brains. Ugh. I was like, this is a strange room, but then it comes into play later. They leave this room, and they try another Hermione performs flagrate, which is a spell that never existed before, and it allows her to draw a fiery X on the door, which is very convenient, and now they know not to go through it. I, I've really realized that I'm pretty sure J.K. Rowling's process for coming up for spells is, ah, crap, how are they going to get out of this one? <laughs> well, uh, let's make a spell. <laughs> like that's, I feel like that's every spell. Yeah, is just I mean, she p- plots herself into a corner and then is like, ah, shit. Uh, they can do, sp- they can do magic. <laughs> I mean, okay, Mike, how would you write it then? I don't know, man. I feel exactly. like exactly they should have focused more on like what spells are capable of doing. I don't know. It's like how many words are in the English language, Mike? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, uh, I don't know. You just want the entire like world built immediately right in front of you this is because i'm an engineer but i just want to know like the like the law of thermodynamics but for 
magic. Like what can and can't happen? Because I've heard people say things like energy can't be, you can't just like make things much like the law of thermodynamics. But then Hermione's just like making a fire reacts out of nothing. It's, so I don't know. I want to, I just want to know the framework of what is and what is not allowed. I don't need to know specific spells, but I just need to know like the first law of magic is that this, <laughs> I don't know. No, th there are laws of magic though. Hold on. I might have to Google. But they're not, okay. Quick. If there are, they're not in the books or at least they haven't talked about them yet. They are though. They're mentioned in the book. Are they? Did I miss all these pages? Yeah, hold on. I want that dumb one that Hermione quotes all the time. It's Hogwarts called History? Gamp's Law of Elemental Transfiguration. Either I am forgetting this or it's going to be described <laughs> later. <laughs> what book is that? Please be oh, sick. Oh yeah, so there it, it's sick. mentioned once in Goblet of Fire. Oh, okay. But then the all the other mentions are either Half-Blood Prince or Deathly Hollows. Okay. So Nice. We can forget about Yay. this until later. Cool. I'm glad I'm not wrong. No, because I'm afraid of getting things wrong now because I've received multiple uh, negative iTunes reviews that are like, Mike keeps screwing things up that he apparently just read and it <laughs> makes the whole episode <laughs> horrible for me. And it's like, yo, like I get it and I'm sorry. And sometimes I misspeak or I say things or I forget stuff. But keep in mind that I'm describing in pretty solid detail, like the entirety of yeah. the chapters that happens. Like it's very in-depth spark notes. I'm saying lots of sentences. Sentences. If I get one or two things wrong an episode, I'm still like 98.5% correct. I'm hey Mike, so hey Mike. Things. Welcome to the club. Oh god. Well you your iTunes reviews are so mean. Yeah. Mine, even in the ones where they say like Mike forgets stuff, they're like, I really like the podcast. And Mike is really nice, but he forgets things sometimes and it's and it makes me upset because he just read them. But yours, it's like, uh, girls talking about history. This is dumb. I could get more information exactly. on Wikipedia. It's like, no, you can't. Yep. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Oh man. And then people call sure. you bitches and stuff and that's not okay. Yeah. So mm -mm. yeah. We, we we can cut all this out. <laughs> I don't need to air my dirty laundry on we'll it out. Oh come on, that's what we're here for. Um so right. Hermione uses the flagrate spell, which makes a fiery X on the door so that you know which one not to go through. They enter a new one after the doors rotate again. I do also find it very convenient that the doors rotate once they sense that someone has left the door. And the room that they enter looks sort of like a disheveled courtroom a la Wizengamot. You can't see me, but I'm fist pumping because, God, I love all of the rooms in the Department <laughs> of Mystery. And we're going to talk about it once we, like, finish up with all the rooms. Good. But... Yeah, I really wanted them to go oh, into every shit. single one. I was bummed they only went into, like, four. I mean, they went into a decent chunk. I mean, Harry personally did. Yeah. but you got that extra room when they're like fleeing yeah, yeah all right anyway so it's a sunken pit with a stone terrace and there is a, a dais as well and an old archway with a dark veil over it i'm i really wanted to see like a picture of it because i'm not exactly sure when we get later into the falling through the veil thing mm -hmm. but the whole room kind of looks old and decrepit and like everything's ready to crumble the veil that is over this archway is swaying as if someone has just recently moved through it and Harry gets this weird feeling and sensation that someone is standing right behind it. Mm -hmm. Hermione is scared and says, we should leave. At this point, I noted that I thought it would be really funny if when they go through door three, it's just Statler and Waldorf, the two old guys from the Muppets. And then they say some sort of like lame pun. They open the door and they're all like, ho, 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 the Department of Mysteries, more like the Department of Missing Keys. Doesn't anyone lock a door in here? Oh, ho, 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 ho. I really just wanted that to happen. Happened. My my head is in my hand right now. You can't see it, but big old face pump. My head is in my I head. I just thought that'd be great to be mm -hmm. like one of the doors should be comedic. So Harry gets this weird feeling that he really wants to go through the veil, and he starts to hear murmuring on the other side of the veil, and it's tripping me out. Mm -hmm. No one else can hear it aside from Luna. So I'm wondering if this is a Thestrals Part Two thing where it's only people that have seen death. Hermione yells that they are here for Sirius, and that finally snaps Harry back on track and he doesn't want to go through the veil anymore. Oh boy, yeah. But that's not the end of the veil. <laughs> nope. No, it's not. Oh, God, the veil. I had so many emotions as a 15-year-old reading mm -hmm. this book and the veil. Uh, I think I was 15. I don't know. Around. 12, maybe? Whatever. Oh. All we know is that Harry is 15 because it's the fifth book, and you just add 10 to it. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, Mike, you <laughs> I'm got learning. it. You did oh my so gosh, good. I learned so many things. As they are leaving, they notice Ginny and Neville are also entranced by the veil. So it's got to be some sort of evil thing that makes people want to go in it. But they don't really explain what's going on. Harry tries a third door and it is locked, which makes me very happy because finally one of these goddamn doors in the Department of Mysteries <laughs> is locked. Like, finally, there is some sense of security in the Ministry of Magic. It's very important. Hermione tries Alohomora, which doesn't work. And I, I think I've brought this up in previous episodes. Like, what does Alohomora work slash not work on? Like, why would you never close a door and put on the charm that someone has to use Aloha? I just, I'm confused on Alohomora... Because what what stops Alohomora, but then also what does Alohomora defeat? So Alohomora would be stopped by a powerful enough spell. Okay. Which, like in the case of this door, yes, works. It also in later chapters Hermione uses some sort of door sealing curse. Yes. Uh, but Alohomora works on that. Yeah. So it's a level higher than whatever she okay. was using. That's my confusion. Is like it doesn't take that long to to say Alohomora. It's like. I feel the time that you spend using the not as strong locking curse mm -hmm. is negated by how long it takes someone to say Alohomora. So why don't you just close the door and keep running? Right? True. I mean, <laughs> like you true. save three seconds, but you lose three seconds. Right. I gotcha. I gotcha. I know what you mean. Um, also, like Alohomora would be useful on just like a door you don't have a key for. Yes. that's a, it, def it defeats like a regular padlock or a regular. Like a yeah, door. Yeah, like a deadbolt. It defeats a door. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's a reason we learn about it in the first book. Sure, 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 sure. So they try the serious knife that's supposed to open anything, but it melts the blade <laughs> of the knife. Just Harry slowly, you know, killing off any item that Sirius has ever given him in his entire life. It's almost like a sign. Is there another thing that he was given that uh, Harry killed off? Did you finish the book yet? Uh, no, I have the last chapter to read. Okay. You'll see. Okay. Cool, cool. We'll get there. We'll get there. Word, word, word. They try a fourth door, and there is a dazzling light on the inside, which Harry knows is from the dream. He recognizes it. Mm -hmm. So they go through this room, and they see a bell jar on a desk. And inside is a tiny jewel-bright egg that cracks open, and a hummingbird emerges. It fails to fly, like flops down, and then goes back into the egg, which is trippy as shit, and we learn what it is later, but it's basically just like a time loop inside of a jar. It's the time room. Yeah. The time room. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry yells like, come on. And Ginny goes, you dawdled enough by that old arch, which, oh my God, Ginny. Sass master supreme. Ginny. <laughs> I, can you just imagine Harry Potter and Ginny Weasley's children? They're just, they have to be the sassiest children in the fucking yeah, world. Yeah, really sassy. So Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, is that about his kid? Like Albus Dumbledore or Alvin, what's his name? Yes. Albus Severus Albus Potter. Severus. Is he like really fucking yes. sassy? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen it or read it, oh, okay. but I, I can only imagine that all of the children are just the sassy. <laughs> yeah. So they go to the final door in this room and they open it and they go to row 97 because they're in the thing from the dream. Mm -hmm. They go all the way down to the end, which Harry is convinced that is where he's going to find Voldemort and Sirius. And as I've predicted in previous episodes, I think that this is all BS. I think this is Voldemort putting this into Harry's mind. So he's doing exactly what he wants. We learn that this is exactly the case because they go down there. There's no one there. No one is there. They look all around. No one is there. This is the point in my notes where I wrote in all caps, I fucking knew it. Um, Mike's so proud Ron, of himself. Well, I've, I've been so wrong with all the other books, but I've been really good at predicting things in five. So I'm really trying to take my wins because I know I'm going to be wrong for six and seven. I did really enjoy your prediction. My episode. bonus episode. Oh my God, it's so bad, Mike. I felt like some things were right and I was really mad that I I thought my first initial thought was like, the, the prophecy's got to break. And then halfway through the prediction, I was like, no, wait, actually it wouldn't make sense if it broke. <laughs> <laughs> it broke and you're like Dolores Umbridge is gonna come back and that's gonna I, be the major she's showdown she's still coming back I, I'm thinking she's gonna be in the last chapter so either that or the next book but there's this is not the end of Umbridge okay Ron asks Harry have you seen this and he's staring at one of the dusty glass orbs and it has Harry's name on it and there's a date written on it from 16 years ago mm -hmm. and it says SPT to APWBD and then Next line, Dark Lord and question mark. And then next line, Harry Potter. Okay, I want to know who you thought these... The acronyms are? Yeah. I have no freak... So the... I think SP... Oh, oh, I think I know it. Uh, I don't know it now. Wait, did you not get to the part no, where so they I did. said the Yeah, thing I yet? got to the part and I'm just putting it together. Okay. So when I read it, I didn't get it, but I've read the chapters after this. Aww. 
So it's, yes, yeah, Sybil, whatever her middle name is, Trelawney too. Mm-hmm. Why is Dumbledore's name so long? <laughs> Albus PBWB Dumbledore. It's Albus Percival Wolfrid Brian. <laughs> what, <Dumbledore>. Brian? <laughs> <laughs> his yeah. third middle name they is they say it at the beginning of this book his too his third middle name is it's Brian? when he's at the like wizard gamot <laughs> yeah but his middle name is Brian <laughs> Albus Percival Wolfenstein Brian Dumbledore <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely Wolfenstein yeah that's the got it. got it in one. Oh, Brian oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that's the best so Harry goes to touch it. <laughs> of course he does. Yeah, because he's an idiot. Hermione and Neville plead with him, don't touch it. This is probably a bad idea. You probably shouldn't touch it. And Harry's defense is, it's got my name on it, which is a same, Harry, same. horrible defense. Not good reasoning there, Mr. Potter. That's why, I, I feel like that's why any Batman villain would kill me. Because they would just leave a present on my doorstep that has my name off, uh, name on it, and I would just open it. <laughs> uh, Be like, oh, this is covered in question marks, but it has my name on mm-hmm, it. Yeah. And then the Riddler murders me. Or it's just like an Amazon package, because there's so many times where I'm like, did I get something from Amazon? And then I open it, and I'm like, oh, right, yeah, I was out of floss. But, <laughs> but that's how someone <laughs> should get me. Amazon purchases are so boring. Oh, man. <laughs> So Harry decides to touch it because he's dumb, and when he grabs it, it is hot. He brings it down off of its holder, he stares at it, and nothing happens. And then they hear a voice say, Very good, Potter. Now turn around nice and slowly and give that to me. And I knew it. it, Don't do Jason Isaac dirty like that. (laughs) Well, this is because at this point I was like, it's either Voldemort or Lucius. But then they end it with a drawling voice said. And I know that that is not Voldemort because they always describe Voldemort's voice as high pitched. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really got a description of Malfoy's voice except for that it's like kind of smooth and stuff. So, But you know that it sounds exactly like Draco. Yeah, (laughs) just by the way that he said it, you're like... Snide motherfucker. (laughs) Yep. By the words, I was like, all right, it's one of two people and i by the process of elimination i my guess here is that it's lucius malfoy that's the end of chapter 34 we get into chapter 35 beyond the veil and it is lucius uh, malfoy also beyond the veil oh boy yeah once i saw the chapter was called beyond the veil i was like oh no we're going back to the veil which i was like half excited about half worried about and uh the second half of me was correct mm-hmm. so you learn that it's lucius malfoy and immediately black shapes emerge from all around them these are the death eaters blocking their way there are 12 death eaters Harry's heart sinks, as it very well should, because he fell right into this Mm -hmm. trap, and Hermione was right, and I was right, and everyone was right, except for Harry. He got his friends all in danger. Yeah. This fucking... This is, like, this is bad. This is really bad. Harry asks where Sirius is, and all of the Death Eaters start to laugh, meaning that Hermione was correct. He's clearly not here. This is definitely mind playing tricks on him some lady says the dark lord always knows and then it says that always echoes throughout the room and is this the foreshadowing of the snape always where it's like the good the the, all i know is that the reason we like snape is that he has a crush on harry's mom and he says always after all this time or all this bullshit but i did anytime i see the word always in this book my my ears perk up and i'm like hmm uh, it's not. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, I, it's I, not. I figured that was the answer. So this lady keeps talking smack, mocks Harry about thinking the dream was true, uses a baby voice the whole time. All I this want other to know, stuff. wait, did you know, who'd you think it was? Oh, I, th- I thought it was Bellatrix for okay, sure. Okay, okay. Um, because we've, we've heard mentions of Bellatrix, but we haven't really like met her, but we do know that she's an evil conniving lady. And my note specifically, I wrote... I'm assuming this is Bellatrix. And then the very next line, Lucius says, Bellatrix. (laughs) So it's like right after I wrote it down. So Malfoy calls the orb the prophecy, which is interesting. I was confused when they called it the prophecy because they kept referring to the weapon before. And I don't know if the weapon is separate or if they were calling it the weapon so that Harry wouldn't no like because Voldemort figured out that Harry can sometimes see what Voldemort sees I don't know if like the code word for the prophecy was the weapon okay so no here's the thing so Harry's an idiot yes okay uh Sirius is talking to him and Harry he says something like Voldemort is trying to get something something he didn't have last time and Harry goes like a weapon and then they're like "Eh, sure like a weapon 
So it's not it's not a weapon. It's just Harry was like, oh, we're just gonna sure whatever. Oh, that's just my assumption. None of the Death Eaters ex- explicitly call it the weapon. I, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I need to go back and look and see what they refer to it in that chapter when um, Harry, rather than having the dream has the it's i think it's chapter 26 or 27 it's like he has the vision of voldemort talking to avery and rockwood about uh, Bode. Rookwood, yeah yeah rather than have the corridor dream he has this vision because i thought they called it the weapon there okay but i'm not sure hmm. so they call it the prophecy which is interesting because i had no idea what this means at this point until i read more chapters so malfoy says that harry better give it over or they'll start to use wands. The kids all raise theirs in unison, which is great. And Bellatrix tries to use Accio, but Harry uses Protego before she can finish. So keeps the orb secure. Are these chapters when you start ranting about uh, how spells should be longer because everyone keeps getting interrupted? <laughs> or spells should be shorter, yeah. It was more in the uh, the fight scene later. Mm-hmm. But yes, I, I, I had a rant about this on Twitter where like, if there was a one syllable spell, it would be so overpowered because there's a million times when they're running away from the Death Eaters where people get tripped or protegoed or stopped or tackled or something mid-spell. Like, they'll be like, Avatica, uh! Or like, Crucy, uh! Or like, Wingardium Livy, uh! <laughs> and it's just, if there was a one word one syllable spell that was just like i don't know slap like it would be way better than anything because you wouldn't have time to stop it (laughs) that's true i will give you that that is true it's like when you're in a video game like a fighting one and you have the big charge up attack but someone stops it because they just like jab you really quickly and then you like lost all your progress Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it's if they if there was one of those someone could just run around and be like jab 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 and stop everyone from doing big mean bad spells no i agree i agree protegos are mid accio at this point they threaten to torture (sighs) Ginny. Poor Ginny. Yeah, poor Ginny. Really? She's already gone poor through the Ginny whole- Ginny has been through so much. She's been through torture already. Can we not give her round two? She got literally possessed. Like, literally possessed. Yeah. For an entire year. And she was 11. It was her first year at Hogwarts. Ginny is as badass as she is, not only because she had to grow up in an entire family of just boys, yep. but also because she went through the most shit than anyone in this fucking yeah. book series. Hot take. Welcome to Hogwarts. <laughs> You've been possessed by the devil. Like literally though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> so Harry steps in front, threatening to break the prophecy, which I think is a great idea. I feel like Harry should have just spiked it earlier. He should have. He's just been like, Psh, ha ha. So Harry asks why Voldemort wants it so badly. Multiple Death Eaters hiss because he's said Voldemort's name. Mm -hmm. And Bellatrix freaks out, screaming, you dare speak his name? And I still want to know what is so bad about saying his name, because they still really haven't defined it. I think they do in one of the later two books, because when I've brought this up to other people, they've mentioned it. But right now... It's, we're almost done with five full books, and all we know that is that saying his name is bad, but that's it. But Bellatrix's real gripe is that it is, quote, besmirching his name with your half-blood tongue. But yeah. Harry replies, well, so is Voldemort, which is gold. Mm-hmm. I don't understand, and maybe we learn later in the later books, but, like, I don't understand why Voldemort, who is a half-blood is all big on this whole pure blood thing. You definitely learn about it later. I'm not going to spoil anything. Okay, good. But But yeah, I mean, similarly, Hitler didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes, so it could be the same kind of thing there. Mm -hmm. It's it's a little bit of self-hate going on there. Interesting, interesting. So she tries to hit Harry with stupefy, but Malfoy deflects it, which causes some other orbs to crash and ghosts to come out of them, speaking a prophecy and then melting into thin air. So now we know at least how a prophecy works. I mean, we get into some specifics at the end of this book about ghosts. Mm -hmm. They're not ghosts. Okay. (laughs) They're just like, you know, they're remnants of what the prophecy was. Yes, exactly. They are ghostly looking figures. But yeah, it's basically Mm -hmm. just like, save me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. But prophecy orb version <laughs> like it's like a yeah, hologram that's actually a really good comparison right because really it, like it's like a recording of the prophecy when it first mm-hmm. happened yeah and the the help me obi-wan kenobi is a really good you know star wars and harry potter are both very good uh examples of the hero's journey Ooh, so having yeah. this prophecy you know something that arguably quote unquote started it all is mm-hmm. very much similar to the help me obi-wan kenobi you're my only hope because yeah the prophecy is the reason that voldemort wanted to kill harry potter is because he found out that the prophecy said one of them has to die yes right i thought that's it uh, right? 
I thought the prophecy is like made when he was born or before he was born because it said the prophecy was 16 years old mm -hmm. and Harry's 15 in the book. So it's like a little bit before he was born. My thought process, and I guess they didn't say it explicitly, but my thought was that this prophecy was made. Someone found out about it. Mm -hmm. told Voldemort that there was this prophecy that was there because it said Voldemort knew like partial information. Someone told him about right. it. Right. So Voldemort knew up to, um, it says the one with the power to vanquish the dark Lord approaches born, uh, to those who have thrice defied him born as the seventh month dies. And then that's when the person who was overheard them got kicked out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, right. So, he doesn't know about the, like, one of them has to die thing. Exactly. But I guess he's just being proactive and it's like, well, if I murder them. Yeah, he's like, if it has the power to kill me, I should kill it first. Yeah, so he doesn't know that one of them has to die. But he's just taking that next step because he's proactive. Yes, just a <laughs> proactive evil person. Just a go-getter, that Voldemort. <laughs> just going above and beyond. <laughs> So the reason Malfoy deflected the stupefy spell is because he does not want the prophecy orb to crash. Malfoy's like a good middle manager. Yeah, he is the worst and we're supposed to hate him, but I do respect him because he is crafty and like does a good job of making sure that they actually accomplish this mission and don't just break the orb and kill Harry. Yeah. Like they actually, he's, he's there. He's like, look, he's keeping the crew together, mm -hmm. keeping Bellatrix in line. We got, we have a purpose here. We have a specific mission. Let's get this done. Yeah, like a true middle manager. Love him. <laughs> so Harry asks what it is. Malfoy says, oh, Dumbledore never told you uh. that the reason you bear the scar is hidden in the Department of Mysteries? No, no. Dumbledore doesn't tell Harry shit about shit. That's the <laughs> literal entire plot of this book series. We learn why later during the Dumbledore apology chapter. <laughs> the best chapter. <laughs> <laughs> My thought here is that it's 16 years old, Harry's 15, so maybe it was made when Harry was conceived, And but we'll learn about this later. And then this is in the point where I noted, my guess is that Voldemort found out about this prophecy, which is why he wanted to kill Harry. And my guess for the prophecy was that Harry would defeat Voldemort, which isn't exactly correct, but mm -hmm. on the right track. The Death Eaters start laughing, which allows Harry to whisper to Hermione, who is standing behind him, that they should smash the shelves, which is a great... He, like, steps on her toes first, too. And then she's like, yeah, what? He, like, he plays footsies with her to get her attention and then whispers to her. And she's like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> like, Harry, what are you doing? Like, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. But, <laughs> yeah, for a split second, she'd be like, what the fuck is going on Harry <laughs> so Harry stalls for more time so that they have time to prepare for this he gets Malfoy to run his mouth which is great and at this point I thought of a great diss for Malfoy more like Malfoy am I right <laughs> oh god <laughs> Woo! but yeah mouth uh, I just said Malfoy. you just said Malfoy I did Mal it Malfoy <laughs> Malfoy has a true like Bond villain moment where he explains oh. the t entire plot to Harry. Yes, he really does. He goes on this big old monologue. I love all of the different ways that J.K. Rowling uses monologues or people explaining things so that she can inform the reader. And I liked that this one was a new twist, which was dramatic villain monologue to explain to the reader how the prophecy orbs work. Very important. <laughs> which was great. So Lucius reveals that the only person or people who can retrieve a prophecy from the orb are the people that it is about. So in this one, it is Voldemort and Harry. Voldemort found this out when he tried to get other people to grab the orb, hence Bode, you know, being sick and hospitalized. And whatever. poor Sturgis. Poor Sturgis. I love Sturgis Podmore. He's got such a good name. What's Sturgis' status at this point? Is he in Azkaban? Oh, I don't know, actually. Let me look. I think he's... I'm gonna look it up. Okay, I think he's in Azkaban at this point. Because he was, he was like, arrested for being involved. He was arrested for, like, trespassing in the Ministry of Magic. That's sad. Yeah, he was sentenced to six months in Azkaban for attempting the break-in. Okay, yes. And we haven't seen anything since. So he's still there. Honestly, he should probably escape since there's probably no more Dementors there. Yeah. Just walk out the front door. Harry asks why Voldemort couldn't just get it himself, which is a very valid question. Mm -hmm. And all the Death Eaters laugh. Bellatrix says it would be silly for him to reveal himself in the ministry. And my note here, the kids didn't pass a single person. I feel like Voldemort would have been fine. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's true. I feel like it, the cover-up would have been a little bit more crazy if it was Voldemort coming in mm -hmm. than if a bunch of kids came in. True. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, because that would go against our theory, which was that it was some sort of jinx to make sure that no one was there. Yeah. But you're right, is that like if they still wanted to delay the release of like, hey, Voldemort is back that maybe they just wanted to like pin everything on Harry and then Voldemort can still like lurk in the shadows a bit more. Yeah, but. exactly. I think that was the plan. So while Bellatrix is talking about this, 
Harry screams, now! And all of the kids use Reducto, and the shelves start crashing down, and all of these prophecies start floating up into the sky, which seems like this could be problematic and have lots of implications, but we just ignore that <laughs> because Neville and Harry just run away and get separated from the other crew, and they go through a door that they came in. Hermione uses another charm that we've never heard about until now to seal the door behind them. Coloportus. Oh, uh, yes. Cola, what is it? Cola portis? Cola portis. Cola portis. I sometimes recognize what they mean because some of them are Latin and I took Latin in high school because I'm a big old nerd. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's something this door. Is not ringing any I bells. Mean, portis yeah, means probably. door. Yeah, porto. Yep, yep. So maybe it means lock door. Uh, <laughs> so when they get through the door, they realize that they don't know where Ron, Luna, and Ginny are. But they Dumb basically asses. just go, eh, I'm sure they're fine, is basically their resolution to this problem. Guys, no. <laughs> that seems dumb. That seems like a it's bad very choice. Dumb. It's a very poor choice. Uh. So they hear the Death Eaters on the other end devising a plan to basically spread out and try to find all of the kids. Neville, Harry, and Hermione decide to leave. We also get a really good list of all of the Death Eaters in the scene. We do. Which I really appreciate as someone who likes minor characters quite a bit. Yeah, do, do you have it right now? Because yes. I, I didn't, okay. R read off the list of Death so Eaters because I, I know some of them. We have Lucius Malfoy. Mm -hmm. We have Not, who is injured in the children's escape. He was new. We have not heard of his name before. Um, yes, but he does have a son that goes to Hogwarts, apparently. Oh. Which I think... We you, haven't met his son yet. Yeah, I, you either meet him or he's like one of those characters that got mentioned during the sorting or something like that. Yeah, or maybe, maybe one of the kids that was upset when they were mentioning that like when Harry's article came out and all the kids who had named the Death Eater name mm -hmm. names were like getting picked on and stuff. That's true. Uh, there's Jugson. <laughs> Jugson. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't think you ever hear anything more about. Nope. Um, you get Bellatrix. Yes. You get Rodolphus, which Rodolphus is uh, Bellatrix's husband. Yes. Um, you get Crab. You get Rabastin. Mm -hmm who is mm -hmm. uh, Rodolphus's brother. Oh, okay, okay. Dolohov, yep. McNair, we've heard. Avery, mm -hmm. Rookwood, mm -hmm. and Mulsabur. Mulsabur. Yeah, these are all ones we've heard before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mulsabur was from a while ago. Yeah. Mulsabur was definitely from one of the earlier books, though, because I explicitly remember writing in my notes his name because I thought it sounded cool. Yeah, he, he does have a cool name. I will give you that. <laughs> So yes, we have all of these. The list of Death Eaters is all named, so we know who who's on the roster mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> who's batting for the team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the batting lineup is, uh, and they they devise a plan to like divide and conquer and find the kids. Neville, Hermione, and Harry are running away from this door, and just as they are about to get out of this first room, they hear the Death Eaters break through that door that Hermione put the charm on. Mm -hmm. They're in the room with all of the desks and the bell jar. The time so they room. hide under the desks. Time room. The time room, yes. Time room. One Death Eater says to check under the desks, and then the kids are like, ah, shit. Ah, fuck, so, our, our perfect <laughs> yeah. hiding place. Fuck. Yeah, like, it's a desk. Most desks you can see under, <laughs> unless unless it's, like, a particular desk where it's a drop down. I don't think this was the best place to hide, but their options were limited. So Harry hits the Death Eater that is nearest him with Stupefy, and one of the Death Eaters is going to use Avada Kedavra, but Harry tackles him by the knees. I think this is very intense that this person is going to just kill a child, but yeah. they're Death Eaters. It's in the name. <laughs> it does come with the territory. It's kind, of, kind of what they do. Neville tries to help, but uses Expelliarmus, which unwands or disarms Harry and the foe. So then Neville tries to correct this by using Stupefy on the Death Eater, but he misses him like over his shoulder. Oh, no, no. Oh, so he misses him over the shoulder mm -hmm. and the thing knocks into a glass fronted cabinet on the wall that is filled with various shaped hourglasses. Which I'm assuming are a bunch of time turners. The cabinet fell to the floor, burst apart, glass flying everywhere and then sprang back up onto the wall, fully mended, and then fell down again and shattered. And oh, it's just a yeah. continuous fucking thing of going over and over and over again. <laughs> and the argument is that no one has been able to use time turners since uh, this incident because they're constantly in a state of being destroyed. Oh, that's so convenient. Oh, God damn it, J.K. Rowling. Oh, God, I wrote this stupid thing in the third book that was dumb and broken, and now everyone makes fun of me for never using it. I'm going to write this vague thing that this is the reason why time turned. Oh, my God. That's the stupidest shit. Yeah, man. That's the stupidest shit I've ever heard. Uh, that's a convenient <laughs> uh, tie-up of that plot hole, I oh, think. Oh, my God. Ugh. <laughs> 
The time turner just makes me so upset. I know. I get it. I understand. <laughs> you and Misha Stanton should have a talk about that. <laughs> they absolutely hate the time turners. Good. No, me, I'm going to have Misha on for the beginning of the sixth book. <gasps> I'm very Yay. excited to have another person on that doesn't like the books. Because we haven't had that since David Tress in the beginning <laughs> of Gobble to Fire. And that was one of my favorite guests was he was just like i hate this chat like i hate this book so much and i was like I'm, you're I'm on that episode hate listen to those episodes so hard it's gonna be great <laughs> yeah we'll have me sean they'll be great so the death eater who is fighting harry rips off his mask and is about to use stupefy but harry uses it first which no, hermione a, does. like hermione oh hermione does. sorry sorry I sorry i'm reach. reading along as you do no this is good this is so this is reason. good to have um no hermione uses it sorry my notes i use h for hermione and hp for harry but hermione uses it first which why is isn't there a class about talking quickly? Because clearly an essential element to being a good wizard is being able to be like, expect up a up like before, or like stupefy before someone can say stupefy. I feel like they should have like a speed speaking class. Like speech should be a subject. I mean, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I, I don't disagree. Yeah, right? So Hermione uses it first. The Death Eater falls into the bell jar and here we go. So oh, the jar acts so like a good. bubble where it doesn't break. So his head just kind of like goes through it and then it reforms after it passes through. His head is stuck inside. It starts to shrink very fast and grow bald and balder, and then it turns into a baby's head. But it's not done, because after it turns into a baby's head, it turns back into an adult's head, and then back into a baby's head, and it's in this weird time loop, and it's terrifying. Yep, just hard yes. <laughs> like, what the, uh, it is, uh, is it in the movie? I really hope it is. No, it's not, and it what fucking the f- should who be. The, who the fuck made the fifth movie? Throughout all of the episodes of Potterless about Order of the Phoenix, I've said multiple Multiple times. I hope this is in the movie, and every single guest I've asked goes, nope, not in the movie. What the fuck is in the fifth movie? There's nothing. Literally the only room that they go into in the uh-huh. fifth movie in the Department of Mysteries uh-huh. is the um, is the veil room. Wait, so the, do they go into the one with the orbs or no? Well, yes. Okay, so it's oh, okay. the veil so the room veil... and the orb room. Okay, but they, oh, there's no brains in the in the green goop? No brain room. No. Nope. What? Mm-mm. Oh my God. Yeah, that was, I think someone told me I might be mistaken, but I think the fifth movie is the sh- one of the shortest movies, even though it's Probably. the longest book. Yeah, yeah, that seems which right. Which seems very problematic. So, oh, God damn it. Oh, I'm going to hate the fifth movie. Yeah, uh, I, I can't wait to watch it with you. <laughs> oh, it's going to be so horribly good. So they, they start to run away and two more Death Eaters are hot on their tails. The mm. kids go out the next door and the Death Eaters bust through before Hermione can lock it. They hit the kids with a pedimenta. Harry uses Petrificus Totalis on one, which is a wait, sweet wait. callback because we've even seen Hold Petri- on, Sorry, you missed, you missed the fact that the Death Eater with the baby head stands up and starts like flailing oh, around. Yeah, I have the, yeah, right. I mentioned this later, but when he actually does something, but no, yes, he does he yeah, does yeah. stand up and start flailing around, but then he comes into play later when he like actually messes some stuff up. So, Harry uses Petrificus Totalis, which I think is a great callback cuz we haven't seen that since they used it on Neville in the first book. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Hermione uses Silencio on the other, which is also r- really underrated. I didn't think of it, but it's like, oh yeah, that limits a lot of spells you can use if you can't talk. Yeah, until you learn <laughs> about nonverbal spell use. Yeah, until we learn about whatever the fuck this draw an X with your wand is spell mm. that we, I still have no idea what that shit is. Oh, I think I think I know. I think you learn in the next book, but I'm not going to okay, yeah. spoil it. It hasn't you. been revealed to me, but I'm terrified by it. Mm-hmm. So as you just mentioned, the death theater who was silencioed uses a spell without words he draws like a, an x and a purple flame or is it an x or just like a wand motion i forget it's just I a th- wand motion yeah um, so it's not and this an x. is he we should like... mention that this is dalahov too oh the, oh right 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 and so dalahov is kind of important because he murdered uh molly weasley's brothers yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so dalahov does this, he just kind of waves his wand dramatically. He doesn't have to use any words. And a purple flame comes out of his wand and hits Hermione straight in the chest. And she just instantly crumples to the floor, which is absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. Neville is then kicked in the face oh, by a Death Eater, Neville. which breaks his wand into two pieces. Just Neville can't catch a break he can't. ever. Never. Like, he's never going to catch a break. The Death Eater rips off his mask, and this is when we learn it is Antonin Dolohov, mm-hmm. and he is the one who murdered the Pruitts. He threatens, with hand gestures, because he can't talk, sure. that, ha- that Harry needs to hand over the prophecy, or he's going to do the same to Harry. 
Just then, in comes the baby-headed Death Eater, crying and flailing his arms and kicking and all this other stuff. There he is. There's my boy. <laughs> it distracts Dalahoff enough where Harry uses Petrificus Totalis on Dalahoff and he gets all stiff as a board. Um, we never learn which Death Eater is the baby Death Eater, but I'd like to think it's Jugson. Yep, I think so too. I think it's Jugson. It's definitely Jugson. That okay, is cool. now officially canon according to the Potterless Podcast. Harry starts shaking Hermione and then we get into another, a really bad J.K. Rowling writing thing where she uses words that have sexual connotations and she need I want to buy her a thesaurus because she says quote Neville groped for Hermione's wrist which is just uh can you well, not he's, he's covered in blood and like can probably barely see since he's got a broken nose but groped yeah like, okay can we not I gotcha <laughs> can we he reached for her wrist he stumbled for her wrist like he gra- he attempted to grab uh, just uh he felt for her like he groped ugh. okay so, not a fan. I'll give like, it to you. I'll give it to yeah. you. It's not great. <laughs> when he grabs her wrist, he feels a pulse. So, we know that she is not dead. Neville picks up Hermione, and they leave the room into the rotating doors room. Hermione's fiery crosses have since faded, so they don't know where to go. Wait, hold on. Do we, do we talk about the fact that Neville's been using his dad's wand for quite a bit of time? Whoa. I had no idea. When yeah, was this so mentioned? he says, um, my grand's going to kill me. Uh, Neville said thickly, oh, blood spattering out of right. his nose. That was my dad's old wand. Right, 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 right. And so, as we know from Ollivander, the wand chooses the wizard, right? Mm-hmm. So this means that Neville didn't go to Ollivander's to get his own wand. He's been using his father's wand. <gasps> Is that why he's shitty? Why he's so fucking terrible at magic? Oh my god! Does he go to Ollivander's to? I mean, he needs a new wand. He right? needs a new wand, right? <gasps> yep. Oh my god! That's so good. That was such a minor detail. I didn't even pick it up. Oh my goodness. Yes, that's, that's awesome. That's why I'm here, Mike. Yup, that's that is why, why I have here. guessed. That's why I've guessed the notion about Harry Potter. That's so good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. That's amazing. So Neville picks up Hermione. They leave the room. They go into the rotating doors room. Hermione's fiery crosses have faded. And just as they are about to just pick a random door, the other three kids exit. But they're giggling? Ron has <laughs> Well, something... Ron's giggling. Ron is giggling, yeah. Ron has something dark trickling from the corner of his mouth which is interesting so he's giggling for some reason Ginny's ankle is broken which sucks poor Ginny again apparently what happened was four death eaters chased them into a room with a bunch of planets and Ron who is giggling at everything makes a Uranus joke saying we saw Uranus up close ha 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 get it (laughs) which is incredible just Amazing. absolutely incredible. So good. <laughs> Luna said that Ron got hit with a curse that she didn't recognize. So we don't really know could what's going anything. on. Yeah, it could be literally anything. It also could be J.K. Rowling just being like, I don't know what happened. Oh, no, he's we'll drunk figure. now. Fuck well, it. I need, I need to finish the book. Let's, let's figure this out later. So they choose a door just as the remaining Death Eaters enter the main room. They go through and they lock it. They're back in the brain room. The problem with the brain room is that there are a bunch of other doors in it, which the Death Eaters from the main room they can hear say that they're going to go through other doors to get into it. So they are not safe there. So because of that, Neville and Harry lock every other door with Col- Coloportis. Luna goes to lock a door, but just as she's about to do it, five Death Eaters break through before she can finish the spell, and she goes flying through the air. Ron, as you've mentioned, is basically drunk at this point. Mm-hmm. He qu- he says, hey, Harry, there are brains in here. Isn't that weird, Harry? And Ron does Accio brain. Fucking Ron. <laughs> Fucking Ron, <laughs> the, really. The brain comes, tentacles spew out from the spinal cord attachment part and just start wrapping Ron all over as soon as he touches one of them. It basically is like that rope spell, but with a brain. So way creepier. Harry tries to use spells to stop it. Doesn't really work. Ginny gets hit with Stupefy. Luna gets hit with Stupefy. So it's basically Harry and Neville versus five Death Eaters, which doesn't seem like good odds. They decide that the best course of action is to just run away, which I think is very smart. Smart. He runs with the prophecy over his head, (laughs) trying to get the Death Eaters to pay attention to him, which works. It's great. So he runs in the door that the Death Eaters used to enter. As he's running, the floor vanishes and he realizes that there's not a floor there because he's back in the veil room and it's the sunken pit. So he falls down all of the stairs and the Death Eaters laugh. 
And Malfoy enters and starts talking smack because that's what Malfoys do. That's what Bond's villains do. Exactly. Just true Bond villains. True Bond villain. Harry says that he'll hand over the prophecy if they let the kids go. Enter Neville to stand up for Harry. Neville shoots out a bunch of stupefy spells. He's literally just like, stupefy, stupefy, stupefy. Except he's got a broken nose, so he can't pronounce it right. Yep, he's saying, he's like, his broken nose makes him say lots of words with bees, or at least that's how the, the book wrote it. A Death Eater grabs Neville from behind. Malfoy then says, your grandmother is used to family deaths from our cause. Your death won't come as a great shock, which, oh my, uh That's fucking harsh, man. That's ugh. fucking harsh. Like, it's really villainous and, like, really good, but also, oh my god. God. Mm -hmm. So then enter Bellatrix to start talking smack. She says that they should torture Neville until Harry gives up the prophecy. She uses Crucio, which makes me scream, Crucy, no! And <laughs> Harry is about can to that be the over. Can that be the uh, pun that you use for this The pun episode? for the tweet, Crucy, no! Thank you. <laughs> Harry is about to hand it over, but enter Moody, Sirius, Tonks, Kingsley, and Lupin. Oh, all my faves. Which... I almost 100% nailed in my prediction bonus episode. I was so close. You were very close. Who did you say also showed up? The Weasleys? No, I oh, I think I didn't say Moody. I said I said Sirius Tonks, Kingsley, and Lupin. I did not think Moody was going to come along for the well, journey. Well, Moody's got to come along. He's a badass. He's he the most badass, badass out of all that five. Yeah, so when they enter, I wrote really big in my notes, let's go. <laughs> let's fucking go. <laughs> yeah. So Harry gets with Neville and the firefight is on. Someone grabs Harry by the neck and it says, quote, his hand was groping towards the hand where Harry Keep was groping. holding the prophecy. More groping twice in the same chapter. This is not okay, J.K. Rowling. So Neville somewhat shanks the dude in the eye with he his does. broken wand. He does, he fucking wand. shanks him in the eye. Yeah, it says fucking he shanks Neville. him in the eye, but it doesn't, it doesn't say that it like sticks in his eye. It just basically like pokes the dude's eye in really, really, really badly. It's really good. So, like, Neville, I really like Neville a lot. I hope he gets his new wand and then becomes a baller in the sixth and seventh book because the come up of Neville and Ginny in this book has been really satisfying. So, shanks him in the eye. Harry then hits him with stupefy, so an amazing one-two punch. And we learn that this Death Eater was McNair. Mm -hmm. So, Dolohov has Moody laying on the ground, bleeding out of his head with his magic eye rolling away across the room. True Moody fashion. He wouldn't have it any other way. While Dolohov is doing this, he hits Neville with Tarantalegra, which is the leg rapid dancing spell, mm -hmm. which makes his legs just kind of flail in a bunch of directions and Neville falls over. Dolohov is about to do the same spell that he did to Hermione to Harry with this trademark hand motion, but Harry uses Protego quickly just in time. Again, an example of interrupting by talking faster. Mm -hmm. Harry describes it as like a dull knife cutting across his body, which yeah, like, oh boy, that's yeah, it's like up. even with Protego, he still feels part of the spell and you're right it is described as like still pretty painful kind of like when you get shot and you have a bulletproof vest on like yeah. it still hurts it was that's what i like imagine that's, that's like. basically what happened mm -hmm. so dolohov gets up and he starts to use Accio, but Sirius just like lays him out. Just like a football. He just fucking like, spears hard. him. <laughs> yeah, he just like big old hard hit like a truck stick in Madden, just like knocks him flying. Mm -hmm. So the two of them start dueling. Harry hits Dolohov with Petrificus Totalis again before he can unleash the signature move. Tonks limply falls down the stairs at the hands of Bellatrix, which is very oh, scary. Oh my girl, no. And then you see jets of green light flying around, and I don't know if this is confirmed, but the only spell that has explicitly been described as a jet of green light so far has been Avada Kedavra, I believe? No, it's true. Okay, so does that mean like green light is Avada Kedavra? Because I know yes. red light means stunning spell. Wow. Yes. So there's green just light, Avada's... It's just, there's killing curses being thrown all over the place right now. That is absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. Sirius tells Harry to, to go and help Neville, which he does, but he is tackled by another Death Eater, and then you learn it's Lucius. Harry, while tackled, passes the prophecy to Neville, kind of rolls it on the ground to him. I also like that Lucius Malfoy is close enough that he's snarling into Harry's ear. <laughs> yep, yep. It's, it's, like, it's like pillow talk. <laughs> it's angry pillow talk. <laughs> so he, he passes the prophecy to Neville and then Quick uses an impedimenta on Malfoy. Lucius tries to curse Harry and Neville, but Lupin jumps in, 
telling Harry and Neville to leave. This is a common theme of the adults being like, yes. get the fuck out of I here. I mean, they're children in a like middle of yeah. a fight where there's just a bunch of killing curses happening. Mm-hmm. At this point, this fight is so hype. In my brain, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the hypest thing ever. Little do you know, next chapter, we get Dumbledore Yo. versus Voldemort, which is the hypest shit in the world. It's and that's going to be on the next intense. episode. And I'm just going to freak out about it for 58 minutes. Mm-hmm. But... <laughs> But they, the kids leave or are starting to leave and Neville's robe starts to rip while they are going up the stairs. And of course, the robe rips and the prophecy falls out of his pocket and one of his flailing, kicking legs <laughs> kicks the prophecy after it falls out of his pocket and it flies across the room and crashes on the floor. Yep. Harry tries to intently listen on what the figure that comes out of the prophecy says, but there's so much happening in this fight. Like there's so much yelling and Crashing screaming and curses and going around. And yelling. Yes, it's it's he just literally can't hear it with all the commotion going on. As they're starting to go, Neville's face goes completely blank. But then you learn that it's excitement because he screams Dumbledore. Or Dumbledore! Mumble, yeah, with his broken nose state. And it is Dumbledore. And it's incredible. He basically gets all of the Death Eaters to stop fighting by his presence. Like he just enters the room and all it's the Death amazing. Eaters are like, oh my God, <laughs> they just stop. One dude tries to run away. Dumbledore just uses his wand without a spell and just like yanks him back into place to be with the rest of them. So good. But then while this is happening, uh, Bellatrix hits Sirius with a red light. So it's the stunning spell. Just after Sirius talked smack to her about missing him with the spell. So not a good look for Sirius because he was like, ha ha ha, I think you can do better than that. And then she does better than that she does. and hits him in the chest. He falls very dramatically off of the, the top of the platform or archway towards the veil. And it is described that he falls a long way down. And while he's falling a long way down, Harry calls his face handsome again, which is like the fourth time this has happened. You understand, he's, Mike? He's just real handsome. He's got a big old crush. <laughs> he's so pretty, that Gary Oldman. Uh, so he starts falling slow motion effectively through the veil, and he just doesn't come through the other side. I kind of want a mental picture to understand what this looks like, but basically it is it's in like a normal world, you would think he would come out the other end, but he, it's almost as if he's teleported because he kind of just like falls through the veil and then doesn't come out the other end. And Bellatrix screams in glory. Harry tries to run after him. Lupin says, there's nothing you can do, Harry. It's too late. He's gone. And that's the end of the chapter. Okay. I, I have a lot that I need to discuss now. <laughs> Please do, because this is the end of the episode, so let's get it all out there. Okay. So they don't do it in the book series, and for some reason I thought they did. Uh-huh. But in the um the movie version, and this is the only like plus that I will give to the movie version. <laughs> okay. Is when they're fighting, there's a line where Sirius yells like nice one and then forces Harry's head down like so as like two stunning spells come towards them or something like that. In the movie, Gary Oldman does this fucking amazing job where he goes, nice one, James, talking to Harry. Ooh, that's really good. It breaks my fucking heart every time. That's really good, though. Because, like, Molly calls him out earlier on in the book. She's like, he's not James. You can't just, like, pretend that your friend is alive and it's Harry. Yeah. And, like, Sirius has gone through so much shit. Like, he was 19 when he got sent to Azkaban. Uh-huh. Or something like, or yeah, like 21 yep. or something ridiculous yes, like that. Yes, very so, young. like, he's very much, like, men- mentally, he is still a child. Oh, for sure. He's still a young adult, and so that's why he's so, rec- uh, so reckless, and so why he, like, you know, looks to Harry not as a godson, but as a friend, mm-hmm. like, in a lot of the book. Yeah. So I have a lot of oh, feelings about that. That is really good, though. Yeah. I'm glad they added that. Yes. I, I thought it's definitely a good addition. Also, I want to talk mm. about the Department of Mysteries. Okay, let, let me hear it. <laughs> From what you've read so far, Mike, what would your assumption be? What What are they studying in the Department of Mysteries? I think they are literally studying stuff they don't know about. Yes. <laughs> okay. no, so 100% they are because as you go through each of the rooms, it's like concepts that, you know, even magic or science cannot really explain. Okay. So we're looking at the time room, right? Yeah. So the time room, just the concept of time in general is something that wizards, 
you know, they can study, but they don't really understand why it's happening. That's why the little constant stream of life and death is happening within that bell jar. Mm -hmm. Um, We go to the brain room where Mm -hmm. they're studying thoughts. Yes. Madame Pomfrey does a really good line in the later chapters that we cover where it's like, yeah, you know, Ron's recovering from his injuries, but uh, thoughts can hurt a lot more than physical injuries, which is just like a fucking brilliant line. Mm -hmm. And like from J.K. I mean, underrated. Yeah, but this is coming from J.K. Rowling, who has like talked openly about suffering from depression. And I, I yeah. fucking love that idea that, like, thoughts can hurt just as much, if not more, than, like, physical oh, injury. easily more. Easily more. Mm-hmm. Um, and wow. then, yeah. I'm trying to think. So, space. Just the movement of the planets. Yeah, because the, yep. They, Wizards aren't good about room. that shit. So, like, <laughs> that makes sense. And then we get to the Veil Room. Which, what, which whatever is, the fuck that is. Uh, Mike, do you really not know what the Veil Room is supposed to represent? Uh, do they tell me in the last chapter of the book, or am I supposed to be smart? Um, I, I don't know if they say it outright, but it's death. The veil is the thin line between life and death. Oh, God. So because Sirius fell through the veil, he He's literally died. Yeah. But what Then what? what's the whole thing where, like, the kids are drawn to it and there's, like, murmuring on the other end? Um, I, I mean, like, that's kind of a weird concept. I, I like to think that because... In particular, Luna and Harry have both suffered, like, really close deaths in their lives Mm -hmm. that, like, you know, they feel compelled by, you know, what's beyond the veil. You know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. like, Harry has his parents over there and now he has Sirius and I don't want to ruin who Luna's person is across the veil, but Luna has someone close to her that is across the veil and Mm -hmm. so obviously that's calling to them. You miss the people who, you know, you loved in real life. Uh, and once they're gone, you know, the veil calls to you because, hey, I'll get to be with them again if that happens. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's Damn. fucking dark for a children's book, huh? Yeah. I, well, I mean, at this point, it's young adult novels, as everyone yep. likes to correct me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be in the children's book section of my library, but it is. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, well. Whatever. But yeah. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Crazy, crazy chapters, real right. deep stuff. And and Dumbledore even mentions in the the Dumbledore apology chapter, as you called yes. it earlier, <laughs> that the room that Harry couldn't get into is the room where they study the concept of love. Ooh, yeah. yeah. So, Ooh, I like so that. many complex things going on. So many complex stories. But yeah, that is the beginning of the end. But we will have more episodes discussing the rest of it. But that is all for this episode of Potterless. But. Julia, thank you so much for joining and providing Always your expert pleasure. insight, especially that freaking wand Neville thing that I completely missed. Oh, that yeah, was huge. Oh, yeah, man. That's what so I'm here good. for. But yeah, if you guys listening want to hear more of Julia, you should check out Spears Podcast. If you don't already listen to Spears, I don't know what you're doing. The fuck I don't know why you you'd listen to I don't know why you would listen to Potteros and not Spears. Spears is great. It's basically drunk history, but about mythology. But, but then also finding ways I will never cease to be amazed how you find ways to take like really old stories and then turn them into like yeah if you look at it this way it's about like empowering women to be independent and it's like what <laughs> like you guys putting modern interpretations of these super old ass mythology stories is incredible and I love it oh thank you <laughs> and you always just make the listener feel like they have a warm heart and there's hope in the world oh <laughs> That sounds so cute when you say it like that. <laughs> but yes, everyone go check out Spirits. It's great. And also, check out Potterless stuff. Potterlesspodcast.com has a bunch of fun things. We're on any social media. We're on all of your preferred podcasting apps. And when you're on those, if you rate us and review us, that really does help a lot. Because some people like to leave negative reviews, and most don't type anything. They just leave one star, and then they don't say anything. Which is like, why do you hate me? I want to know what's wrong. Why do you hate me? I need to know. <laughs> But yeah, if you leave ratings and reviews, more people can find us, and that makes everything more fun. But Julia, thank you so much for joining. Of course. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world, at the end of every school day, wizard on! Yeah. If you want bonus content like stickers, director's commentary, bonus episodes, t-shirts, you can head on over to patreon.com slash potterless and learn about becoming a patron. Potterless was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Andreas Oselby, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vanderslay, Sadie Bear, Emily Whiffen, Jesse Horgan, Maggie Zobazek, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkes, Daisy Kartenstotter, Klaus Serlopu, Michael Bukes, Sean Jones, Alexander Stark, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Chiotto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, and Samantha Rose. Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. Thank you guys so much for listening, and until next time, 
as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!